Who's the best player in the world right now? I have to say Leo right now. Recently, Leo was in the discussion for being the best player in the world, but Bustio, who is literally the 2023 world champion, chimed in on this debate. Uh, I don't think Leo is the best player in the world, no. In terms of impact for me, I don't think Leo brings as much impact as like Alpha and like Aspas, like less. So is Bustio right or wrong? And if Leo isn't the best player in the world, despite his monstrous rating, then who is? And how can we more accurately determine the best player if rating and KD don't cut it? In this video, we're going to answer all those questions and more by analyzing better statistics, which can tell us more about the impact of a player instead of just how many kills they're getting. Using all the data from VCT Champs and Masters this year, I'm going to compare the best players in the world on their actual game-to-game -game impact using a variety of methods. And I'll even put in Ye's performances from last year just for fun since he was more of an undisputed best player in 2022. And you're definitely going to see why. By the end of this video, we'll have a way more accurate understanding of who the best player in the world is. And on top of that, the data reveals a lot about team play styles and what a team needs in order to win a championship. So stay tuned until the end. We're going to go over our analysis plan in just a second. But first, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, Immortal Roadmap. Immortal Roadmap is a premium coaching service which offers comprehensive coaching from industry experts with a rank up guarantee or your money back. They offer everything you need to hit Immortal Plus in eight weeks tops. And they're so confident in this program that if you don't rank up five divisions within eight weeks, they'll even give you your money back. They have already helped hundreds of students hit Immortal and Radiant with their stacked coaching roster, which features Konpeki and over a dozen Radiant coaches with VCT experience, such as Comet, who was an analyst on Ascend when they won champs in 2021, Screwface, who is obviously the sixth man on EG when they won champions this year, and Gangsta, who played on Disguised, Immortals, and Knights. If this offer sounds good to you, click the link in the description to sign up now because there are only 12 spots remaining out of the 60 spots total. Thanks again to Immortal Roadmap for sponsoring this video. Alright, let's start by talking about what it even means to be one of the best players in Valorant and what kind of stats we can look at to discern the good from the great. Firstly, to even be in the discussion for best player in the world, your team had to have a reasonable chance at winning champs. For that reason, I'll only be including all players who placed in the top 4 of champs and only a select few players who placed in the top 8 for comparison purposes. Team play is a large part of what makes a good player great, but it's hard to measure how good a player's communication is with data. What we can look at is how much value they give their team and how critical they are to their success. The best players also need to boast strong fundamentals, so we'll take a look at how often players are getting trades and being traded. Finally, kills still do matter, but rating and KD give us no information about the impact of those kills and what they meant in a round. You've probably heard the term impact frag thrown around before, which implies that certain kills are more important than others, but what does that even mean? We're going to quantify the impact of every single frag to determine once and for all who had the most game-to-game -game impact in 2023. So that's our game plan. We're going to start by looking at how much value an individual player brings to their team. Recently, I saw this awesome post from Pablo on Twitter who does Valorant stats, which shows your probability of losing depending on which agent on your team dies first. For example, people normally have an assumption that if your controller dies first in attack, your win rate is significantly impaired. However, what his insights actually show are that initiators are much more important than controllers on attack, and any of them dying first with the exception of Fade significantly affects your chance to win. Using the same line of thinking, we can look at all the data from Masters and Champions to see which players decrease their team's win rate the most when they die first. In other words, how important is it for a player to be alive for their team and how does it affect their chances to win a round? Huge thanks to Augment.gg for providing me with all the data for my research. Check them out in the description below. When we look at our top players and how likely their team is to lose if they die first, we start to see some interesting characteristics of certain teams. Firstly, Demon1 is by far the least important player to keep alive first. When he dies first in a round, EG only had a 58% chance of losing the round. Compare this to EG's clutcher, Calm, who if first blooded, means that EG has a 75% chance of losing the round. Remember that these are all non-traded kills. This clip is an example of a non-traded kill onto Jing, as he dies and no one returns a kill within 3 seconds. 
Going back to the graph, here are all the players between Demon 1 and Calm, before we reveal the most important players to be alive for their team. You might say that Demon 1 plays Jet, so it's fine if he dies first for his team, but Jogamo, Something, Durka, and Jing all happen to be way more important to keep alive than Demon 1. Finally, Ye's 2022 stats reveal that he was quite important to keep alive, as Optic had almost a 79% chance of losing if he died first in a round. This is pretty in line with how dominant he was all year, and we'll continue to see statistics supporting this fact throughout the video. But the most important players to keep alive this year were Cowanzine for Loud, Forsaken for Paper Rex, and finally Aspass for Loud. If any of these players were first blooded in any given round and were not traded, their team had more than an 80% chance to lose that round. It's really interesting to see two different Jet players on top teams in the world be at complete opposite ends of the spectrum, but this undoubtedly gives Aspas some credit for being an incredibly important player for Loud, and it doesn't necessarily mean he's a baiter as well, as we'll see later on in this video. Now we have some idea of how important individual players are for each team, but we can go even deeper than that and find out how much their individual performances correlate with their team's ability to win. In other words, how much does an individual's performance directly contribute to their team's success? For example, does Durka need to pop off in order for Fnatic to win games? In all games throughout Masters and Champions, where Durka drops 16 kills or more, Fnatic wins an average of 12.45 rounds. But when he drops less than 16 kills, his team only wins an average of 10.46 rounds. This means that his team wins an average of 2 more rounds per game when he performs well compared to when he performs poorly. This is a significant difference, as I'll reveal all the players below Durka, but it's actually a pretty small spread compared to a lot of other players on this list. Let me explain the reason I chose 16 kills as a cutoff. It's because 15.2 kills per game is the average number of kills that any player had in both Masters and Champions. So getting more than 16 kills a game means you had an above average performance, and getting less than that means you had a below average performance. Now let's look at how every other player's individual performance affected the number of rounds that their team won. And we can start to see some of the big difference makers are Alpha, Kong Kong, and Devi, Ye in 2022, again showing just how dominant he was, but the player whose performance matters the most for their team is Jing. When Jing gets more than 16 kills in a game, his team is winning an average of 5.56 more rounds per game than when Jing performs less than ideal and gets less than 16 kills. His performance is a huge difference maker for his team. But something really interesting is how Paper X are all in the top half of this graph. What that really means is that Paper X's aggressive and mechanical style shows here, where every player on their team can be the one to take hold of a game and carry. And that's just simply how their team works. Something else that's interesting is how all of EG, who are Masters runner-ups and Champions winners, are all in the bottom half of this graph. But we're going to revisit this phenomenon later in the video. Let's also take this chance to assess team fundamentals of each player by looking at trade statistics. The first graph shows the average number of trade kills each player is getting per game. Again, we're seeing Jing at the top with an average of 3.58 trades per game. We need to point out the non-duelists here like Chichu, Stax, and Ethan, meaning that they have top tier team fighting fundamentals. But being a well-rounded player means that you have to also know how to die in good positions as well. So this next graph shows how many of your deaths were traded by your team. And it's really quite impressive to see Jing at the top of this graph as well, showing that he is probably the best team fighter in the game and someone who knows to go in for his team, but also successfully trade his teammates. If you remember the first statistic we looked at, which showed that Aspas is the most important player to keep alive in a round, you may have thought he was just a baiter. But now we can see that Aspas has the second most traded deaths behind Jing, meaning he's definitely going in for loud and making sure to die in spots that are tradable. We should normally see the duelists at the top of this second graph, but what sticks out like a sore thumb is how low Durka is on this list, despite being the solo duelist on Fnatic. In fact, not a single player on Fnatic is in the top half of either of these graphs, and that really reflects their playstyle, which rarely relies on taking huge teamfights. Although I think that this was a weakness for them during their champs run. I broke this down in another video linked in the description. 
The last and most important statistic we're going to look at is how much direct impact each player is getting from their kills. But before we get to that, I want to revisit some of our earlier graphs to point out something really interesting about our 2023 champions. Remember this graph about the chance of losing a round when certain players are first blooded? If you look closely, you'll see that nobody on EG is that high on this list. EG depended most on Calm being alive later into rounds, which makes perfect sense in terms of roles since he was an initiator player and EG's clutch player. EG's spread of most important to least important player, as well as everyone having very mild values on this list, hints at a very functional team with everybody playing their roles well. When we look at the second statistic, which describes how dependent a team is on an individual's performance, take note of how there isn't a single EG player in the top half of this graph. For EG, it really did not matter if any one player was performing better or worse in a match. All players still found a way to be consistent, and EG would still win. This again hints at the elite teamwork and consistency on EG. They were not dependent on good individual performances to win matches, and that's kind of the point I want to get across before I actually crown a best player in the game. The best team in the world has no clear standout performers, and that's exactly what made them the best team in the world to begin with, because teamwork and team cohesion will always matter more than an individual's performance. Okay, so how are we actually going to evaluate the raw impact of kills in Valorant? There are a lot of ways that we can look at this but the most straightforward measure of impact is how much an individual kill contributed to the success of a round. It's obvious that getting a kill when it's 5v1 means way less than the last kill in a clutch. So first, we need to quantify what the advantage is for every single man-to-man -man scenario to know exactly how much more important getting a kill in a 2v4 is compared to say a 3v5, which is not really a difference we can figure out without looking at the data. I looked at every single round outcome of all games played from Masters and Champions to determine the exact chances of winning every single combination. For example, the chance to win a 2v4 is about 9%, but the chance to win a 3v5 is 12%. These are all the probabilities for any given team to win in each of these scenarios. Now with this data, we know that getting a kill and going from a 1v5 to a 1v4 only improves your team's chances of winning by 1%. Getting the first blood, bringing the round from a 5v5 to a 5v4, increases your team's chances of winning by 20%. Now we can assign a value for every single kill. But before we go on to calculate that for every player, we need to make an assumption on this data. We're going to assume that every single xv0 situation means a 100% win rate for the side with numbers. This is not entirely true because there are rounds where the bomb could explode, causing attackers to win after they are already dead. But for the purposes of calculating impact, we can make this assumption. Okay, now we can quantify the exact impact of every single player and compare them to see who really had the most impact in 2023. I'll just briefly explain what I'm doing here so everyone understands the statistic a little bit better. I'm looking at every single kill that each player got in a game and calculating exactly how much each kill increased their team's chances of winning. For example, Jogamo kills Jing here, bringing the round from a 5v5 to a 5v4. Going by the graph I just showed on win percentages, this kill increased EG's chance at winning the round by 20%, so we count that Jogamo increased EG's win percentage by 20%, and we add up all the impact of their kills over the course of one game. Then we do this for every single game they played and average out the number to get our final value of game to game impact. For this list specifically, I'm only including players who finish in the top four of champions this year. One by one, here are the top five most impactful players of 2023. The fifth most impactful player of 2023 was Alpha, who on average increased Fnatic's chances to win rounds by 305% per game. Another way to look at this is that Alpha's kills alone earns Fnatic 3 rounds every single game. Bustio is right in calling out that Alpha is one of the best players in the world in terms of game to game impact, and these better stats show it as well. I want to call out that Les was not really far behind in 6, who increased Loud's chances to win rounds by 303% per game. The fourth most impactful player in the world was Paper Rex's Something who increased Paper X's chances to win rounds by 309% per game. His teammate Jing was third at 326%, 
Demon 1 rightfully earns the number 2 spot at 333%. And finally, the most impactful player on this list was Loud Aspass, who increased Loud's chances at winning rounds by 339% per game. Here is the full list of all 20 players who finished in the top 4 of champions this year. And what's interesting is that despite Aspass being the most impactful player, there isn't a single player on EG or Paper X in the bottom 5. Interestingly enough, Ye's 2022 impact was higher than everyone else on this list. And trust me when I say that nobody in 2022 was even close to this number. When we disregard the top 4 teams rule, there were some other players that really stood out, but sample size and their team's final placements mean that they cannot be considered the best players in the world. But it's worth to mention that Cloud, who is the incredibly promising Giants initiator player, also had 352% contributions, as well as Kong Kong, who made deeper runs than Giants in both tournaments. But there is actually one more player that had significantly higher impact this year, despite his team not making any deep runs. I really wonder if you can guess who this player is. This player increased his team's chances to win rounds by 382%, which is significantly higher than every other player on this list. This player was the 2021 champion, CNED. Navi only played a total of 13 maps in Masters and Champions combined, and actually lost 8 of them, but somehow CNED's kills alone almost won 4 whole rounds per game for Navi. We're definitely going to want to follow these 4 players into 2024. Okay, so now we've looked at all the data, who is the best player in the world? Obviously, there are so many considerations, such as what role they play and what their team's playstyle is, but if I had to choose just a single player out of this entire list, I would have to choose Jing. For all the metrics we looked at, Jing was always comfortably in the top percentage. Paper X loses nearly 75% of all rounds where Jing dies first. They rely on Jing performing well to win games, as he earns 5.56 more rounds for Paper X when he performs well compared to when he performs poorly. He comes in third for most kill impact. And I personally have a soft spot for players who know how to trade and be traded, which is such an important fundamental skill. But in my opinion, you can make a very, very, very solid argument for any of these four players. At the end of the day, lifting the trophy for your team is what matters. So who cares who the best player is anyway? I want to leave off on this final graph, which starts with EA's impact from 2022. When we look at the same impact metric for all players on Loud in 2022, when they won champs against EA, not a single player on their team is even close to the amount of impact that Ye had. And you can imagine that there were many more impactful players than any individual player on Loud during that tournament. If there's one thing to take away from this video, it's not who the best player is, but that being the best team in the world means that no one player can or should stand out.